Good evening, I'm Mike Kinetter, and welcome to the UW Now live stream series where we bring you experts from the Wisconsin community talking about timely and important topics. In a show we did at the end of last year, we talked a lot about the declining perception of higher education. And one aspect of that is Americans increasingly questioning the value of a college degree. So tonight, we're going to talk about that topic. What's the true value of a college degree? And does it justify the time and expense that people put into it? It's a complicated question, of course, because people who go to college aren't a random sample of the population. You might argue they have better ability and work ethic than the average person that doesn't go to college. So how do we know what in the earnings advantage of a college graduate is really due to the education versus the selection bias. And so we'll try to unpack that this evening with one of our guests, and then we'll talk about what the university is doing today to ensure that all of our students get the most out of the degree that they choose. So this evening, we are joined by two extraordinary guests. Dean Eric Wilcotts, the Dean of the College of Letters and Science, is the Mary C. Jacoby Professor of Astronomy. He was a Princeton undergraduate. He earned his PhD in astronomy at the University of Washington. He studies galaxies and their environments. And as Dean, he's focused on advancing the research excellence of the College of Letters and Science and understanding the value of the liberal arts degree of the future. And by the way, he's investing a lot in the infrastructure of the college because as you probably know, UW-Madison has really increased access. Our undergraduate enrollment has grown by about 20% over the last five years. So uh, it's a great time to be a Badger, and we've got a lot more Badgers than we've had before. And uh, Dean Wilcots, thank you for tackling that problem. Okay, thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. And our, our uh, leadoff guest tonight is uh, Economics Department member Anant Sashadri, uh, former chair of the department, served for, uh, I think, three terms as chair. He's also the Mary Sue and Mike Shannon Distinguished Chair in Economics. He's the co-director of the Center for Research on the Wisconsin Economy. He's an expert in macroeconomics and public finance, and the top journals in economics are littered with publications by Professor Sashadri. Anant is going to lead us off tonight and he's gonna talk about how economists think about what is the value of a college degree. So Anant, thank you for joining us tonight and I look forward to hearing your analysis. Thank you, Mike. And uh, welcome everyone to the show. Um, Happy New Year to everybody to get started. So my talk is gonna focus on returns to college and college majors. A brief outline of the presentation. Um, we're gonna start off with some data on returns to college. Um, first focus on what the average returns are and what, what marginal returns are. Uh, and in part, this return to college is gonna reflect selection, but colleges do have an impact on, on students' lives and do result in higher earnings potential. Uh, after that, I'll briefly talk about what the returns to college majors are. There's a big variation in uh, earnings across majors. And in fact, this is actually larger than the high school college uh, earnings differences. Um, and then I'll conclude with some thoughts before handing it over to Eric. So why do we care? This is a graph um, from a paper by Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. Uh, Claudia Golden was the most recent recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics and uh, was actually a faculty member in the economics department in the early 70s. So on this graph, uh, we plot, uh, or rather Golden and Katz plot, by year of birth, the schooling, average schooling levels of the average American. So it's, it ratchets up from like seven all the way to like 12 or 13 for the cohort born in 1950. And then after that, you see a bit of a slowdown in education, right? So for the, for the most part, um, uh, over, over the last 100, 150 years or so, you, know, you had technological advances and schooling kind of kept pace. But in the more recent decades, schooling has, has slowed down or years of schooling have slowed down. And my takeaway from this is that too few Americans are actually going to college. Um, and so that's one of the fundamental reasons why I believe we should care about what the returns are. Is it the case that the returns are low? Is it the case that America, and why are Americans not going to college 
kind of at the same rate as they did in years past to keep pace with the technology is one of the fundamentally interesting questions in economics. Let's kind of back up now and ask, is college worth it? Um, it turns out that there is a substantial lifetime benefit from your, for your college degree. There are two main costs associated with going to college. I and mean, the first and the more important one is that if you actually spend four years in college, you lose the earnings potential that you might have had as if you were working for those four years with a high school diploma. But the second, which receives a lot of attention, is tuition. So let's tackle the second question first. Um, the, over the last two decades or so, sticker tuition and fees have increased a fair bit. That, that receives a lot of attention um, in the popular press with uh, people bemoaning the fact that this has risen at a rate much higher than the rate of inflation. But if you and if you actually net out tuition, uh, net out um, financial aid from from the government, from the state, from uh, donors, such as as is the case at UW Madison with Bucky's tuition promise, net tuition and fees actually rises at pretty much the same rate as income, as income per capita, which is not shocking because you know how could it be that systematically the rate at which um, the net price of college is increasing far exceeds income. Um, on average. In, in terms of the benefit side, um, a pattern that you've, you've seen systematically over the last several decades is that people with a bachelor's degree or bachelor's degree and above have experienced fairly substantial wage gains in the last few decades or so. Whereas um, if you look at men who have either a high school diploma or, or did not even have a high school diploma, you have real wages either stagnating or actually even declining. You see the same pattern for men and women where skill premium, the return associated with getting an education has kind of increased. Um, what is the, on average, what is the lifetime value net of these two costs from going to college? So this is a calculation that was done by Avery and Turner that shows that if you were on average, a male graduating from a four-year college in 1965, earned about a little more than $200,000 more over the course of his lifetime, uh, relative to net of all the costs. And this systematically increased over the course of the second half of the, of the 20th century. And you see the same pattern for women as well. Now, how do you translate that to a return, which is you know, one of the things, um, one of the central topics uh, that we want to talk about today. So let's imagine you have a, a stream um, that you that you have either in, in a, a, if you were to graduate with a high school and stop with a high school and compare that with a stream of costs and earnings that you would incur um, if you were to go to a four year college. So the so comparison here is, is between high school and graduating from college, although there's there is a lot of um, you know, a lot of situations in between, but that's kind of what we're, we're focusing upon here. And you then calculate what we would call the internal rate of return. So you want to think of this as like a project. If the internal rate of return is higher than the real rate of return, which is typically around 5 to 7%, then the project's a go. Any which way you slice it, the uh, average internal rate of return uh, numbers are, are very high from going to college on average. So it, it rose between 1980 and 2000 and then fell a little bit between 2000 and 2020. But all these numbers are significantly higher than, than uh, say, the real interest rate in the economy. And these are all real rates of return. What is not included in, in, in this um, return on investment calculation? One, college remains a great place to find a partner. Um, in fact, uh, folks looked at Facebook data and about a, a little less than a third of couples in Facebook attended the same college. Um, and colleges matter a lot for whom one marries. It's kind of hard to put a, put a number to that. Enrolling in a particular institution makes it of significantly more likely to marry someone from that same institution. College is fun. So it's, it's not just the fact that college is an investment good, but college is also a consumption good. Um, think Badger Athletics, think Mifflin Street Block Party and all the fun many of our, your, your alums had when you were in Madison. There are economists who have actually put a number to it, and their estimate for a college not nearly as much fun as UW-Madison is that it ranges in the vicinity of twelve dollars to $15,000. This only further increases the, the rate of return from going to college. Um, one, thing, one aspect that I did not consider in that calculation is that there, there are folks who drop out of college. So as of 2022, a little less than two thirds of undergraduate students in America um, completed their degrees within six years of enrolling. So little, uh, around a third 
a little more than a third of students actually did not finish their education a uh, four-year degree in six years. Needless to say, incorporating this will, will uh, uh, reduce the ROI, but it's still the case that the internal rate of return will far exceed the interest rate. Till now, we've talked about uh, rates of return from an individual point of view, but, but this does not capture what the value to society is. Um, and there are examples of occupations which create positive spillovers. Um, good teachers uh, raise eventual outcomes of students by a lot. In fact, there was a study by Rod Chetty and, and co-authors at Harvard that demonstrated that if you actually were randomly assigned to in an elementary school um, to a really good teacher, it has a huge effect on earnings later in life. Uh, there's, uh, economists have also estimated the benefits associated with medical research, and that can, be, that can add substantial social value. There are other examples of occupations where it's a zero-sum game, where you win and it just comes at, at my loss, so you're not adding any benefit to society. One would be litigation, another would be financial trading, where you're trying to beat the market and you beat me and you win and I lose. Um, and so it, it's very plausible that social value is actually negatively correlated with wages. Finally, one can also look at this from the institutional point of view. What if from UW-Madison's point of view, um, you were to think about costs associated with providing this education. Uh, to give you one example, engineering um, involves a much higher instructional cost. Um, and in fact, there are economists who have looked at this and, and they find that on, on average in the United States, the lifetime earnings of an engineering major, if you actually look at that per dollar of instructional cost, it's pretty much the same as a liberal arts major. Um, it's hard to talk about returns to college without referring um, to the college debt crisis. I have that within quotes uh, because borrowers at for-profit colleges really account for a really large fraction of this debt crisis. Um, and the college dropout default rate is also, is also fairly high. It's really not a, a debt a pervasive crisis. It's more of like an earnings crisis. If you look at uh, graduates from for-profit and community colleges, they earn um, less than half of their counterparts who go to a more selective for, uh, you know, four-year college. So in my view, this is completely overblown. It's a selective crisis that actually affects non-traditional borrowers and college dropouts. Um, it all begs the question, are Americans not going to college because of financial constraints? For example, at UW-Madison, the true price of attending college is, is significantly lower, thanks to the generosity of alums. Um, so the, my colleague, Chris Staber, who's also the chair of the economics department, has a, has a great paper where he goes through a series of models and finds very little evidence that families are constrained, are borrowing constrained. There's only a very small fraction of Americans who would actually like to attend college, but just can't do so you know, due to financial considerations. What then might prevent low-income kids from attending college if it's not tuition, it's not access to loans? Um, some of it's a lack of pre-college preparation. But there's increasing evidence that suggests that many high school, uh, high achieving uh, low income uh, students do not apply. But when presented with information, they actually attend, they apply, and they thrive. Um, and so lack of information is something that a lot of economists are looking at more seriously. And uh, we, I believe that this is one of the more important reasons why you, you don't see greater participation. Schooling increases earnings. Is, th is that just reflective of the fact that smarter people go to college and they earn more? Or, is it, um, or do, do colleges actually do anything? Um, so is it the case that students are actually uh, non-randomly assigned? Um, no, clearly it's the case that some of it's selection. Um, but this college premium is substantial even for marginally admitted students. So there's one really cool paper that looks at um, I think it's in the state of Florida, where you look at those with just a high school GPA just below the admissions threshold, compares that with uh, those just above the threshold. And, and you know, there's a big earnings gap. Um, so for, for two students who are not very different from an academic standpoint. And so uh, there's no question, while some of it's selection and some of it is the result of colleges, colleges are adding value. Let me turn uh, quickly to returns to college major. So the, the, if you look at the earnings differences across majors, they're very large. And they're larger than, in fact, the earnings gap between high school and college, college grads. So here's some data from um, actually UW-Madison data uh, from the US Census Bureau. It's from the post-secondary uh, employment uh, outcomes um, portion of the US Census Bureau. So these are um, 
UW Madison grads who graduated between 2007 and 2009. These are their earnings one year after graduation, and you know you, what, there are. Um, so I have all the the five most popular majors, including computer science, uh, economics, um, psychology. I think biology is in there and business sort of, uh, it ha- it includes finance as well. And you see fairly substantial differences ranging about, about a factor of two differential between uh, you know, some of the less paid majors and some of the more highly compensated majors. Um, but I'm, what I, I'm going to show you two additional graphs in terms of median earnings uh, five years after graduation and 10 years after graduation. So you notice that at the very bottom, you have computer science and engineering. They're, they're very similar. Um, in fact, engineering is a bit higher than computer and information systems. Five years after graduation, that kind of flips. And 10 years after graduation, it flips even further. So, so there are two or three takeaways here. One is, you know, you, you have initial differences, but these initial differences are a bit smaller. They tend to grow over time, which represents returns to experience. Uh, the second is you might start off with a major that looks very lucrative right after graduation, but you want to think carefully about what the lifetime benefit is. So some of these majors end up um, being less lucrative like 10 years out. Um, and so there are several interesting patterns one can kind of notice. But the bottom line is, you know, these differences are very large and much larger than the differences between you know, high school and college. So what are the, the returns to college majors? Um, what can we say about this? Um, one interesting fact is that high return majors also tend to have lower earnings variability, at least in the data that we've looked at. This makes them potentially even more desirable if you're risk averse and you think you know you don't you don't want to have too much variability in earnings. Uh, but these high return majors actually have lower earnings variability. So this is a, there's a substantial causal effect of major choice on earnings. Um, and I, I think this reflects not just instruction, not just what colleges do, but also career preparation. In the economics department, um, we a bunch of alumni um, uh, more than almost 15 years ago created a career office that's actually done wonders for the department in terms of placing students. And so, so it's a combination of both what you what you give in terms of instruction, great instruction combined with great career prep. The returns to college major also swamp the returns to college quality. I mean, too often we're obsessed with is one college a lot um, superior to another in terms of college quality. And here's actually some data, similar data, so census data, where I compare Madison, UW-Madison, University of Minnesota, and the University of Michigan. Um, we are systematically, or we're, we're, we do better than Minnesota, slightly better than Minnesota, we're worse than Michigan. But if it looks like 10 years out, the differential is between, I don't know, $82,000 and $95,000. And that's kind of small potatoes compared to, you know, the variation across majors that you see uh, within, within an institution. Right, so what drives this major choice? Um, some of it's student preferences, um, some of it's parental preferences who probably want their kids uh, in a more lucrative major and steer them that way. And some of this is compensating differentials, right? So you have high paying majors, you probably have a worse time um, you know, when, you are, when you are actually studying in these high paying majors and, and maybe those jobs are worse in other aspects as well. Some of this is ability in human capital and comparative advantage. I loved physics in high school, but I knew I would be a terrible physicist. Um, I might be a terrible economist as well, but what matters is comparative advantage, not absolute advantage. But I'm gonna come back to the same theme. Um, There is a growing body of evidence suggesting lack of information actually does influence uh, major choice. Um, uh, A paper written by a colleague of mine who's actually gonna be a former colleague, since he's leaving, um, it was a really cool paper that says that students actually have biased beliefs about earnings associated with each major. And then when you, when you actually present them with accurate information, they change their major choices. Um, this is Matt, Matt Wiswall and, and Basit Zafar. Right, so I'm gonna end here. What are the implications, if, if any, from all of this? If in fact you believe lack of information or um, is impeding students from either choosing to go to college or in fact, um, making the wrong choice or regretting their choice. I, I do believe universities have an obligation to provide uh, as accurate information as possible on returns associated with college so that parents and high school grads can make a very informed choice. You know, perhaps uh, develop an easily accessible rate of return kind of dashboard and you know, ensure that people have full information when they kind of make, make this decision. 
I also think universities should provide information and services and career prep to ensure that students can fulfill their career goals. Right? And, and I want to emphasize, it's not as if it's the obsession with majors. You could be a history major and you, we could be trained for Wall Street. Um, or you could be an econ major and you could be trained to work in Silicon Valley. So it's more pre preparing you for a specific career path for a specific occupation, which is precisely what um, SuccessWorks aims to do. And I'm, so with, on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Eric. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anath. Actually, you're handing it over to me. And before we hand it over to Eric, I got a couple of questions. Um, I'm just curious. You know, we do have some students at Wisconsin who can really affect the average. Like, I do remember when I was dean of the business school, we had a real estate graduate uh, who specialized in real estate security. His name was Joe Thomas, and he played right tackle for the Cleveland Browns. No, left tackle. And I think he made like $4 million his first year out of college. Is he in the database? He might be, but, you know, we're careful to plug medians and not means to, to parse. Well, that's them. median information. Okay, so that, not mean so you're not going to be skewed by people. You're not like, be. I always wondered how our successful athletes like uh, real estate security specialist Joe Thomas factored in. And, of course, income and earnings are only part of the reason people might choose a major. They care about impact. But I think, it, like you said, I think it's really important that people understand what the what the actual facts are as we – can gather them. Um, you showed the Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota charts that had differentials. Is that controlling for majors or is that just accumulating everyone? That's accumulating everyone. So that controls for nothing. It's yeah. just uh, comparisons of median salaries, one year out, five years out, and 10 years. Yeah. So I suspect, you know, Michigan not having an ag school and other things, you know, could skew things in that direction might be interesting at some point to try to unpack, you know, what does Michigan engineering mean versus Wisconsin or business? Versus we did. We did look at that. I just for, for brevity didn't put those slides up. You do okay. see smaller differences. So it does suge suggest like you might have guessed an allocative uh, difference. Right. So the composition of majors has an impact on the average rate of return when you accumulate everything. Great. Well, thank you. Um, Appreciate that. We'll come back with more questions from the audience soon. Uh, but next, I want to turn it over to Eric Wilcotts, the Dean of our College, and Letters and College of Letters and Science. And Eric is going to tell us a bit about what the college is doing to focus on allowing students to achieve their full potential, whatever their major may be. And uh, I'm sure you're going to add a few other interesting tidbits in. So Absolutely. Eric, take it away. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And if I can have the, have the slides, that'd be great. But as, so as Adam mentioned um, at the very end of his presentation, we were talking about SuccessWorks. Um, and SuccessWorks is our, the College of Letters and Sciences commitment to families about preparing their students for success in, in the job market, what I'll say success in the real world after, after graduation. Um, while this is focused on what we're doing in LNS, I assure you that this is thematic of what's happening across campus. Uh, as you think about the career preparation that we're seeing, be it in the School of Business, be it in the College of Engineering, School of Education, et cetera. Uh, so this is symptomatic of, I think, a renewed commitment of part on the part of campus for the kind of career preparation uh, and career conversations that Ananth was, was hinting at. Um, let's hop to the next slide. Um, so this is our mission, uh, and that is to drive undergraduate student engagement and career readiness uh, in order to increase their potential for internships and jobs, and, and in some cases, graduate and professional schools, and I'll, I'll get back to that towards the end of the, of the presentation, really thinking about every LNS student's success. Um, the, the, this derived uh, from a vision and a conversation and thoughts that my predecessor, Carl Schultz, had when he was dean of the college about the notion that Ananth was hinting at that there are a set of majors, many of them in the liberal arts, um, that have a lower earning potential. And there is some myth about whether students who are majoring in a certain set of majors are going to be able to get a job. Uh, and so SuccessWorks was developed and grew to address some of those concerns, but also to address a, I think a much more fundamental thing. And that is students who are getting an education at UW-Madison, regardless of their major, are developing a set of skills and competencies that are valuable in the workplace when they graduate. Our responsibility 
is to help the student understand that, understand the skill set that they are developing, help them articulate that skill set in a way that an employer can understand and relate to and make that student attractive to that potential employer, help the student be able to articulate that skill set for both mom and dad and Uncle Bob and whomever else is questioning their choice of major, but also on the flip side, to work with employers to help them understand the value that our students bring to their organizations. So SuccessWorks works both with the students, but also with the, with the employers, and increasingly uh, with our faculty and instructional staff to help us, those of us in the classroom, understand that what we are delivering in our courses is actually something that is going to help that student get a job. So before I dive in, I'll start with a bit of an anecdote uh, I heard talking to an employer a few years ago who reminded me that, that from his experience, uh, some of the best workers that he had were actually students who were some of our music majors. Uh, and this was not a music company. This was a more technically oriented company. Uh, and I was a bit puzzled by this, but the way he phrased it really struck with me. He said, Eric, think about what a string quartet does. A string quartet is a group of students who have developed the ability to work in a team, to work essentially on a project, to be able to help each other out when there's a, a little bit of a slip here or there, but really dedicated to delivering and to performance. And when you phrase what happens in a quartet in that kind of language, you begin to prepare our students better for, for the workforce and to be able to have, have success. So that's what SuccessWorks is, is helping our, our students do. Let's hop to the next slide if we could, Jake. We phrased this in a way and wanted to organize this in a way to also break down the myth that a student's major is a one-to-one -one correlation with the job that they will get after graduation. In some disciplines, this is absolutely true, right? So for my colleagues who are mechanical engineering students, they can do that one-to-one -one correlation between being a mechanical engineering student and getting a job as a mechanical engineer. For many of our majors, actually I would say for the vast majority of our majors, there isn't necessarily that one-to-one -one correlation. So we wanna break down that myth. We wanna use the major as a way to empower the students to have them work on something that they're passionate about so they develop the skills, so they do the work they need to do to get better, but then have them recognize that that major can link to any number of potential careers. And so we've organized SuccessWorks around a set of career communities. And you see the eight of them there on the screen. This is a, this will change over time. As other career communities pop up, we will, we will include more of those. Um, but this is where we wanna start by saying for a given student, you've got access to a number of different career communities. So let's help you understand which one works best for you. Try several, get an internship in a couple of them as you go along in order to be able to have success after you graduate. It's up to the next slide. Um, so this is a, a, you know, a, nice, a nice one of our students, and this is what the career communities provide. They provide different programming. We actually have a career, a set of career courses to help prepare students think about things like, what does a resume look like? What does the interview look like? How should they be thinking about translating their undergraduate experience into a potential career? How can we connect them with the fabulous alumni network that we've got? We've got half a million alum, nearly half a million alumni uh, from UW-Madison. Let's leverage that in order to help our students achieve success when they graduate. We want to use the career communities to make connections to different employers, uh, but also then we, we tailor the career advising for those career communities. So each career community uh, has a set of advisors whose specialty is in that particular community. Let's hop to the next slide. Oh, so this is a nice quote from one of our, our students, a graduate who's going to be graduating in, in 26, uh, currently doing an internship at WORT. I hope some of you remembers that. Uh, but she was able to get that internship by working through SuccessWorks. Uh, and that experience is going to help her move forward in her chosen, in her chosen career. Internships are an incredibly valuable part of the undergraduate experience, an incredibly valuable part of getting our students to prepare to be successful in the job market. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time uh, and through philanthropy from a lot of alumni, we've been able to get uh, internship scholarships to allow our students to try internships in a number of different areas that meet their interests, but allow them to learn develop a network, and then move on to, to success. So I don't want to downplay the importance of internships because it's a critical part of the things that we're doing in, in SuccessWorks. 
Let's hop to the next slide. So we want to take a, a little bit of a pathway here uh, uh, just to show you instead of demonstrate the things that we're doing. So we're going to step through this with this fundamental question of what can you do with your history major? Uh, and I, I imagine you can all imagine a, a scenario when a student comes home for, for the holidays and they you're asked, what are you majoring? And it's saying, I'm going to major in history. And, you know, the, the uncle or the aunt or somebody says, well, what are you going to do with that? We want to equip the student to be able to answer that question. And so we'll step through a couple things. So step one, working with the career communities based on where our alumni are, what one learns as a history major, and I'll get back to that in a little bit. Here is a set of career communities that might be a good fit for somebody who is majoring in, in history. Okay. Next slide, or the next step. This then translates into a set of very sort of specific industries that we might have that student look like, look at, might have that student explore an internship in that are again related back to their career communities. But what you'll notice is that I am now a couple of steps removed from just thinking about that student as a history major. I'm thinking about that student who's now equipped with a set of skills that are applicable to a wide array of industries that you see here on this on the screen. Next slide. For this particular student, for Courtney, who's majored in history, graduated in 2017, moved on to a job as the associate implementation manager at a company called Jelly Vision in Chicago, Illinois. So focused on the information technology, the management, human resources part, translated that into employment with, with a firm in, in Chicago uh, and is now is now quite successful. So that is the path by which we want students to be able to go through go through success works. Let's hop to the next slide. Uh, and this is a quote from what, what Courtney had to say. That the majority of the skills that she used every day were molded as a history major. And that is the fundamental thing that we're going after with success works by making sure that our students and again our instructional uh, staff understand that skill development that happens over the course of a student's education at UW-Madison. And I, I can speak to this from my personal experience in, in my, back when I, they were let me in the classroom, I could teach a class on planetary science. Uh, and the way I described the class, the way I described the learning outcomes of that class was all focused on understanding what a planet is, how it forms, are there planets around other stars, interesting questions about planetary science. Over the course of the semester, the students engaged in doing a research project, working with, with real data. They ended up having a, a group presentation at the end of the semester that was part of their grade. And so I could have thought about the learning outcomes in the class as something that builds the ability of students to work in teams, to problem solve, to make presentations, and to reach conclusions. Again, a different way of thinking about this thing that I was already doing. Um, and so I want to think about that, and we want our instructors to be able to think about the teaching that they're doing and how it relates to developing the skills that students need to be to be successful going forward. Let's hop to the next slide. So we've taken what I what I just talked about and put that on for each one of our approximately 80 majors. Uh, we have these so-called career sheets. So what can you do with your whatever the major happens to be? Um, and the way these are broken down is to address a set of issues, some of which I think Ananth was, was, was leaning into in his presentation. One, you'll see we want to talk about the skills. What is it that as a history major, you are developing talent and competency in? We also want to be honest and address the fact that as a history major, there's some things that you're probably not going to get. And so we want you to think about how to supplement that major with something else. And you can see that there on the, on the left. Um, and then we want to, with SuccessWorks, help help move that student forward. And then on the flip side of the sheet is how to think about your history major in the context of work. That is thinking about where are our alumni, other history majors, and what are they doing now? Who are the employers of our alumni who were history majors? Right. And understand then where recent graduates are, what they're doing, what are the industries, and then a couple of select quotes from both current students, uh, but also alumni. Let's hop to the next slide. So you can see this a little bit more up, up close for that history major. There's a bit of research in there, and you saw that in the quote that we had from the student. There's ability about analytical thinking, creative thinking, written and oral communication, teamwork, and a global and multicultural competency. But we recognize that as a history major, you might not be getting the quantitative data analysis and interpretation. 
So our advice to the student, what the advisors can work with the student on is what to do over the course of your undergraduate career to fill in those gaps in order to be a more complete package when you enter into the workforce. Let's hop to the next slide. And this again, a little bit more highlights on that, putting your history major to work. You can see where our alums are who have our history majors, a wide array of titles. Uh, Epic is a, a top 10 employer of almost all of our majors, uh, regardless of how technical the major happened to be. Uh, and you can see a set of other, other companies there as well as the state of Wisconsin are, are, are part of that. And again, at the bottom, uh, where recent grads are, two thirds of them are employed. 30% uh, of them are continuing education or grad school, and 4% are doing voluntary or service projects. And so that's the data that we have in this particular case for, for a history major. All right, let's hop to the next slide. So overall, this is what we're seeing right now as of that, that five-year period. Within six months, uh, we've got 40% of our LNS students who are employed and working. Another 30% are continuing their education. And I want to point out that LNS majors in many ways, and a lot of our students are going off into professional degrees, be that off into a business school, medical school, continuing on to get a PhD or, or, or a master's degree in any number of different disciplines. And so that's a key part of, of what we're doing. And again, as some subset are also in, in, mili in military and volunteer programs. Let's hop to the next slide. So this is a, a nice quote from a student, and I want to want to wrap up my my remarks with just a couple of a couple of things that we're also doing that don't directly connect with that career preparation that I've highlighted that happens at SuccessWorks, but I think are fundamental and core to what we want to do and some of the things that Ananth was was hinting at. The first part is that our degree is incredibly flexible, which allows a student to easily mix and match and bring together any number of different disciplines for which they might have a, have a passion. And that's critically important when you think back to that skill sheet, which points out the gaps that you might have based on a given major. One of the, the data points that I think we're, we're most proud of uh, is we have the most popular major on campus and that's computer science. Uh, data science is the fastest growing major on campus. Both of those are, are in that category of highly compensated majors. Uh, a computer scientist, a data scientist will get a starting job salary of somewhere to $90,000, $100,000 range. However, about half of our CS majors and half of our data science majors are double majoring in something else. Uh, and that is any one of 70 or 80 different majors across campus. And so students have that flexibility to be able to join what they're passionate about, what they're interested in, and pull together the skills that they're getting uh, from a number of different, different majors. Uh, as Anand hinted at uh, from in the Department of Economics, which really was the, the at the forefront of developing career preparation uh, for our students. They're doing amazing things there. Uh, our folks in the School of Computer Data and Information Sciences are also really dedicated to this question of workforce development and preparing our students to enter into the workforce and have an impact into that, that workforce. Uh, and so that's again with the computer science major, which is the most popular on campus, data science, which is rapidly growing, and we've got a new information science major coming along um, as, as well. So we're committed to making sure our students have the opportunities and the connections in order to be able to translate what happens during their undergraduate experience. And that includes fundamentally getting access to internships to translate that into then success um, in, in the job market. So it's part of our commitment to, the, to our families and our students. And I think it's something that we're doing to directly address uh, some of the issues that Anath brought up in his presentation. So I think I'm gonna wrap up there um, and turn it back over to Mike. Great, thank you, Eric. And um, of course, having studied the data on you know, which Wisconsin alums have risen to the position of CEO of major companies, it's interesting how many of them are history majors and a fair number of lawyers. And I, I think part of that gets to the, the point you were making about being a really good researcher is important because, you you know, when you run something, you realize pretty quickly a lot of decisions you have to make are about information you get from one person about something that happened. And, oh, my God, something terrible happened. And what am I going to do about it? And the first thing you have to do is get the facts. 
because <laughs> when you've heard from one person, mm -hmm. you've heard from one person. Okay. And I think history majors and you know some of our LNS research oriented students are just naturally more wired to think about collecting all the facts and then making a decision. And uh, that's why I always felt like history and law surprisingly showed up, you know, pretty prevalent in that mix of CEOs that came out of Wisconsin, which is, as we all know, is a very large number. Um, Eric, before we go anywhere else, I do want to follow up a question we got from the audience. Do you have a sense of how artificial intelligence might change the opportunities for some of these different learning communities? Or how are we thinking about how AI might change the employment landscape for college graduates? Wow, Is it that's a great, year? You know, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I think it, it definitely changed the landscape, I think, broadly speaking. Um, and I think what we have to make sure is that our students, our graduates, are prepared to enter into and be successful in a world where AI is so prevalent in almost everything that we do. Right. And so we can't we can't stick our head in the sand, right? And nor can we, I think, for the kinds of, of jobs that our students are gonna are gonna be getting, think that boy, AI is gonna take all those jobs away. Uh, and the anecdotally, and this may be apocryphal of a, of a statement I heard about, about chemistry, uh, and somebody saying that that computers are not going to put chemists out of business. Computers are going to put chemists that don't use computers out of business. So that I think is is where is where AI is gonna is gonna fit in. Our students have to be prepared for it. They have to understand it. They've got to be able to wrestle with it. Uh, and I think then it's gonna it's gonna and then, yeah, it will change the nature of some jobs. And we we have the flexibility to think about different career communities and what we want to focus on. Uh, but that's a question of how do we prepare our students to be to be successful in an AI rich world that we're in. And it's great news that computer science and data science are their most rapidly growing majors and they're often combined with they're often combined with something else and, and and students get that right students mm -hmm. and i think there's a there's a great when you talk to our students who are even majoring in cs or data science there are those who are doing it because that's what they're passionate about right they want to be the next person that develops the next great programming language right that's what they want to do some of them want to have that startup, right? That that makes magic. A lot of them are thinking about how do I think about data and how do I think about computing as applied to something that I'm really interested in, right? Be it another science, be it journalism, be it movie making, right? So that's where 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 the magic the magic can happen. Yeah, and so you know, it's easy to get down in the weeds of what, what, you know what occupations are going to be growing. And, you know, at the end of the day, I always feel like if a student comes out of college with a high level of numeracy, literacy, ability to work in a team and reason, it's hard to screw that up. You know, you're going to find something to do. You're, right? you're going to be successful. Yep. Uh, and, you know, you don't have to major in something that immediately translates into a particular career, but you may need help with success works. Exactly. Finding the starting point. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, so we got a question from Lewis Clark. How does the ROI of a PhD versus a bachelor's look? Sadly, I think I know the answer to that as a PhD myself, uh, including lost earnings time. And are there calculations and data available? You know, here we are, three guys with PhDs. Woe is us. I think I think if we'd just gotten an MBA, we'd be better off. Is that true or not? Yeah, I think that's, uh, we have a running joke in the department. We have a PhD qualifying exams, like I, I think most departments do. Um, and you'd be a lot better off if you actually fail those qualifying exams than if you pass those exams. So I think, uh, so earnings, certainly there is a premium as you go from undergrad to master's, from bachelor's to master's. And, and you know, you don't want to do a PhD for the money. Uh, it's certainly on average. And what do you do it for, or not the glory, the fun of it? You you better love what you're doing. If That's not, right. you can't be in the business. So you shouldn't be in the business of getting yeah. a doctoral degree. Yeah. Um, William Schmitz asked an interesting question, which uh, it resonates with me as a 1970s high school graduate at Northern Wisconsin. He says, "In high school, I was discouraged from attending college. 
I went and received my PhD from <laughs> UW Madison. He doesn't say how that turned out for him. I trust it was good. But do we know how much discouragement occurs in high schools? And you know what what does UW do about that, if anything, at least in the state of Wisconsin? I I don't know. I, I don't know if you've looked at that data or not. You know, so I've, I've seen some data from Michigan. Uh, there's actually an experiment that was done in Michigan. So I want to get back to this issue about, you know, what is the information set that high school students have access to? It's primarily coming, especially if you're a low-income student, it's coming from your high school counselor or your peers. Um, so it's completely plausible that in an era, these kids were discouraged. But the experiment kind of I had in mind was the following, which is, a lot of these low-income kids um, it kind of don't seem to fully appreciate the fact that college is going to be free for them. And so in Michigan, they did an experiment where they basically sent admissions letters to low-income students. So rather than just giving them information saying, hey, you know, you know FAFSA is easy to fill out. It's going to take you like an hour. It's simplified. Um, they throw in the towel and say, I don't want to do it. But then they went bolder and then they said, here's an admissions letter if you're from an academic standpoint, you know, well qualified. And the experiment resulted in a very large fraction of these high school students who uh, were presumably discouraged prior to this experiment applying and actually attending the University of Michigan. Um, and so there is a good bit of evidence. That, I mean, to me, that's that's concrete evidence suggesting that they were discouraged to begin with. And this sort of experiment actually had a huge impact in especially getting low-income students, minority students to attend, apply and attend college. And uh, Eric, we, we certainly do some outreach into the schools, at least in Wisconsin, and certainly our admissions office attends career fairs. Uh, or, or college fairs around the country at some of the major feeder locations, don't we? Oh yeah, we have a robust a robust recruiting effort and I'm trying to raise awareness in a lot of high schools. Obviously, you know the ones in Madison, the awareness is is really hot, right? It's so yeah. high that my my kids never actually got anything from UW Madison to say apply here. They just sort of assume that that my kids knew it existed. Um, but we do a lot of work out, particularly in, in urban Milwaukee, but also in the rural counties in northern Wisconsin, right, where where the numbers are small. Uh, but there's a lot of effort there to, to make students aware of the opportunities. And I think coming back to something that Anath was, was hinting at, a lot of this, not a lot, to some degree, there is, is this a sense of disbelief. The notion that a student from a low-income family can actually go to college and not pay tuition engenders more disbelief than, oh, wow, let me take advantage of that opportunity. And so that's a lot of, and you've heard the champs are talking about this, that's a lot of what we need to be able to do in, in a lot of these communities is say, yes, right? It's it's accessible. There are opportunities for you and you can be successful and, and, and move up in, in, in the world, right? And just getting that message across, I think is, is a critical part of, of what we need to do. Yeah, we should probably take four of the most important slides from Anant's presentation, make them into banners, and hang them in the lobby of every high school in the state. I mean, people need to know this, you know, how different your life can be, at least economically, you know, and admittedly, that is not the only thing. But it is something that I think high school students just aren't really very aware of. So, um, question from Tony Chambers to either of you. Can you speak to the non-monetary externalities associated with different majors? You know, and, and he specifically calls out civic engagement, volunteering, better health. Um, you know, I, I don't know if we know much about the tendency to volunteer or, you know, be a philanthropist uh, based on major, but any thoughts about maybe not just the externalities, but but things other than you know financial uh, motivations for different majors? Yeah, we we do have, and I don't know that I don't have the numbers on my head, but a lot of students who are interested in the career community that we've got, sort of around nonprofit, the non governmental space, uh, and as as we all know, right, a lot of our a lot of the college age population is really interested in serving and doing good and having a positive impact. 
and we see that in what students want, how do they want to spend their time, what internships are, 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 are possible and what the ones they want to go after. Um, I don't know that that, le I, that probably is a higher percentage of students from the liberal arts than it is, say, from engineering or, or computer or computer science. Uh, but I don't have the data that, that would back up my my assumption about about that. I was just going to add, um, you know, there's probably there's there's some evidence. It's really hard to estimate social. What's the social return, which is really what the question is about. Right. So till now, for the most part, we've talked about what's the rate of return to the individual. You know, I go to college, I'm better off, but then I go to college, maybe society is better off. What's like the externality? Uh, at least the two examples that I put up in my slides, those are um, ones that economists have estimated. What's the impact of having a really good teacher who is not all that well compensated on, on, um, on a student's uh, income in the future? And what's the impact of medical innovations? I mean, I think those numbers are staggering. I mean, you find a cure for cancer and, and you, don't, you don't quite reap the benefit uh, uh, privately, and there's a big benefit to society. There's actually some evidence, uh, but again, um, big standard errors around this, just given how hard it is to estimate uh, social, uh, societal benefit, that, that occupations that actually create more societal benefit are the ones that are paid less, right? So, so it's, at some level, you as an individual are making this trade off. Am I, for want of a better word, going to be selfish or am I w wanting to create value for society? And presumably um, some of, you know, some of the thought process that goes into the choice of majors involves that trade off between what's good for the individual and what's good for society. And now I'm going to stay with you for this next question. Um, ben Roach wonders, where'd you get that Badger quarter zip? Oh, this one. Yeah. This one, I think my the Econ Alumni bo uh, Advisory Board, I think, gifted it to me. <laughs> or it might have been the previous chair um, who gifted me. At, at, Can you stand at, up? Can we see the whole thing? I mean, what, what do we got there? Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, and we I need to find out. Come on. We need to find out where that's from. You got the Motion <laughs> W. You got Bucky. I'm going to guess it's the bookstore, but I could be wrong. I'll try and find out. Speaking of which, we probably should tighten up the branding. I mean, I don't know, Motion W, Crest W, there's uh, the old school Block W. We better lock in on something for the next. I even week. have another one. Oh, so, wow. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh. Um, question from M Mependano Awake. Um, what do we do to encourage adults 40 to 60 years old who are, you know, are let's just say non-traditional students of any age. And do we know anything about the ROI on coming back and getting a degree at that point? You know, if you if you left when you were halfway and do, do we know much about that, Dean Wilcox? So the ROI side, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll let Anonce do that. I will say that we have, we have ventured into this space um, in in ways where we were we were late compared to other institutions around the country in trying to develop programming for returning adult students, uh, particularly those who had started college, stopped for one reason or another, and then later on in life wanted to come back and, and complete that complete that degree. Um, the experiment we tried you know, demonstrated that our 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 business model was not the right business model to be successful, um, partly because the, the cost essentially of our brand for that population and what they're looking for, that was a mismatch. Uh, and so, so we can rethink about how to, how to do that. And I think what we're starting to dive into now, and there's work happening, I know, in the School of Business, uh, there's work happening in, in the School of Computer Data and Information Sciences around this notion of, well, sort of continual re-engagement with alumni to be a place where alums can come back to, to continue their education as their careers progress. And I think if I were to make a prediction, that's sort of the next sort of frontier about how do we address this? So it's not quite students who are, who are returning, but how do we provide opportunities for students who've, who've gone off, they're in the workforce, now they need to tweak a little bit, add a little bit, can we be the provider for that? So that student, as that as that alum grows in their career, we're sort of growing along along with them. I think that's something we're gonna we're gonna start diving into um, in in ways. And I think there's also things in as we think about badges um, and the micro credentials. The notion that there are individuals who 
who might need some credential, a what could be described as a small set of courses, three, four, that they need to put together in a bundle in order to be able to advance or move up to the next to the next step. So how do we want to think about that uh, for for that non-traditional pop population? Um, but Anath, you might know more about uh, sort of the ROI issues. I mean, in general, the ROI declines with age. Um, but Dean Wilcox raises a good point about credentialing, which kind of gets into into the old a uh, you know old economic question about what is the value added of a college degree. Right? Is it actually human capital? Are you actually learning something in college? Are, are you just signaling? And, and so that gets into issues about credentialing. So if it's really for the purpose of you know, getting some credentials, going back to the labor market, having a good knowledge of what, where the employment outcomes are, that tends to have a positive return. But intervening at a later stage of the life cycle as opposed to earlier in the life cycle, Jim Heckman would say you'd want to intervene earlier. Right. So he has this body of work that suggested early childhood education as an incredibly high rate of return. And it kind of drops as you kind of age. Terrific. Um, we are four minutes from the top of the hour. And I'm just going to say um, people probably need a bio break before the Badgers tip off against Penn State at nine o'clock Eastern time. So I want to thank Ananth and Eric for joining us tonight, telling us about how economists really think about ROI of education and also what Wisconsin's doing to ensure that our students get the best ROI, whatever choices they make. I, I would say my high level summary is the return on investment to a college education is still very high. It does depend a bit on your major. Uh, we do a lot to try to ensure whatever your major is, you're going to get the best. If you're a Wisconsin in-state student, UW-Madison is a screaming deal and your ROI would be astronomical. I mean, if it's good for an out-of-state student, it is really good in-state. Um, and you know the measures of ROI that we we're talking about also stand up to sophisticated attempts to control for the selection problem whereby high ability people, hard workers tend to be the ones who are able to go and be admitted to good colleges, but even they are getting returns beyond just their ability and work ethic. And um, of course, you know, economic returns are not all that matters. We all agree on that, but it is something that's important. And I think increasingly universities should make that information more widely available. And we'll work on the program to get banners in every high school and, um, and uh, make sure our students in Wisconsin understand what's at stake for them because it is really important and you know i think there can be a fair amount of discouragement in certain areas uh just depending on the culture so but thank you for being here tonight uh great very informative program no surprise two great guests and uh i hope to see you all in person soon and i want to thank our audience for joining us tonight but anant eric thank you for being here great yeah, thank you mike thanks everybody for joining us and we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another exciting program, topic to be determined, but um, really appreciate uh, all of you joining us and we'll see you all very soon. And in the meantime, on Wisconsin, go Badgers beat Penn State. In 1848, just two months after the creation of our beloved state, a great university was born, the University of Wisconsin, to serve educate and benefit people from every corner of Wisconsin and beyond. And for 175 years, we have pushed forward, energizing dreams and igniting innovation with educational opportunities that create promise and research that improves lives. UW-Madison is a place where an idea can change the world. And as we look forward, we also look back to stand up for what's right, build common bonds, and a better future. When combined with inspired goofiness and badger spirit, there's an inspirational and unconventional vibe that's all Madison. It's more than just fun and games, though. At the UW, we go from brainstorms to breakthroughs from today's students to tomorrow's leaders. This is where an idea
can change the world, the whole world, a corner of the world, my world, our world. UW Madison's profound Eurekas and personal ahas transform us all and serve the greater good. As proud badgers, we celebrate the last 175 years and the next as the UW charges forward. On Wisconsin.